Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming to hear us uh, blather on about network performance monitoring. Uh, we hope to find that you'll find it an interesting topic. Uh, I hope you had a great KubeCon. Who are we? So uh, my name is Matt Franklin. I'm a senior production engineering manager at Shopify. Um, I joined Shopify about two years ago, joined the observability team, and have since then gone through quite a process of moving off of a, a metrics vendor to an in-house stack and seeing this process of, of building new observability systems uh, come to life. I'm Sebastian Rabenhaus. I'm a senior production engineer at Matt's team, and I'm Shopify nearly five years now. Yeah, and I previously worked on metrics at Shopify. Now I work on logs, and that's uh, also a project um, I worked on recently. A little bit of context. Uh, so at Shopify, we used to have a bunch of different signals that we had different vendors for, and the observability team was responsible for kind of just maintaining those, those vendors. Um, a couple, few years ago, the executive team pushed us to, to figure out how we could build a more unified observability platform for Shopify that meets our use cases. Um, so we in-housed our metric system. We started with a migration there and then moved on to uh, logs, traces. Um, tracing was actually first, but as part of that, we found that we needed the ability to kind of look into our event stores, so traces, logs, and analyze those in new and different ways, right? So we built a tool called Investigate. So as Sebastian and I were looking at this process of, hey, we need to build a, a network performance management tool, we started to leverage that, that capability. Um, to give you some context, at Shopify, you know, like I said, we had a prior vendor. That vendor had a network performance management tool. That tool was very useful. Uh, as many of you who are in infrastructure or are responsible for production systems will know, the first question that everybody asks during an incident is, is it the network's fault? Fair question. We had some ways to answer that after migrating away from our vendor, but we didn't have a really good way to, to get quick answers to those questions. For additional context, uh, Shopify, we run hundreds of, of Kubernetes clusters. Those clusters run millions of containers. Those millions of containers make millions of DNS queries per second and tens of millions of connections per second. So this all left us with, okay, this mission. We have a little bit of time on our hands after we got done with our migra migration. We are prepping up for the next, you know, kind of set of capabilities that we're gonna bring into Shopify. Um, but what can we do to kind of solve this particular use case effectively? Uh, we needed to be able to, to kind of like restore the functionality we took away, right? We don't want to be a burden to our teams <laughs> that are trying to solve problems. We want to be able to help them. We need to restore that functionality. Um, we need to quickly be able to debug DNS flows and, or DNS requests and network flows. We needed uh, minimal impact on our client clusters, right? So the way we are organized from an infrastructure perspective is we have all of our kind of core backend stuff where we manage our observability signals and all, all, a bunch of other different tools. Um, but we also have these client clusters that serve our merchants, right? So Shopify's job is to make merchants successful, so we wanna make sure we're not impacting uh, any of the resources that are there and we have, the last kind of requirement is we have to be able to handle a significant amount of network traffic. So network traffic at Shopify is measured in tippy bytes a minute, so it's non-trivial. And uh, thank you, Matt, for the introduction. And I will give you now an overview over the pipeline we built to get those, um, I, will, I will call them um, network events from the clusters into our ClickHouse and make them queryable. Um, Again, I want to reiterate on that. It was very important to, be, like, to keep the resource consumptions in the client clusters, and especially on the nodes where we have running uh, and kind of agents as low as possible. But maybe let's start with a, a short recap on eBPF, and that's all I will say about eBPF in this talk, so don't worry. Um, eBPF extends the kernel capabilities by running sandbox programs and um, that doesn't require to change the kernel source code or load, load kernel modules in advance so you can do it at, uh, at the runtime. eBPF's programs are event driven and they run when the kernel or an application passes a certain hook. In our case, that would be networking events uh, or DNS events. So, um, they put the collected information into a map and this map is 
shared between the kernel and the user space. So this is how we get the information out of the kernel and then you can get this information from the map and um, process it. This is uh, like, for example, the, the, the connection information. Um, we use the eBPF manager. You, you see this here in this diagram um, uh, that builds on top of Celium and we use uh, predefined um, programs for um, the connections, DNS queries, and other network-related metrics. So now let's have a look on how this um, looks on the node. I will go from the node to our storage clickhouse. So on each node, we have running the system probe exporter as a daemon set, um, and this is the system probe itself and an exporter. The system proof, as I said, uses eBPF manager and um, programs to capture um, the capture network events, and it watches connections itself. Like it's it's this is this is connections uh, for local containers, where you get the um, process ID, the IP, the port, remote IP, and the remote port. Then DNS queries, the, where you get the process ID again, the client IP, the resolver IP, and the type, and the status. And then we also look for TCP queue length um, metrics. This is, this is the only metric we currently export. There might be more in the future. We're, we're just starting here. Um, the exporter then uh, scrapes the system probe. The system probe has a, um, it's, it's a small Go program. It has a, um, is it has a protobuf, um, so it scrapes protobuf from the system probe, and it for each, each scrape it gets the diff compared to the previous um, scrape. So all the DNS queries that happened, or all the connection information, like how a connection changed, and what it also does. I was saying that on the on the network events we only have the process ID. But what we want is the container ID because when we have the container ID, we can map all the metadata we have on a container like port, deployment, region, cluster, whatever to this. So um, the exporter also has a map from process ID to um, container ID and then it tags the network's event accordingly and writes them to, here's only one vector instance, but we have multiple vector instances running in a cluster, writes them into a vector instance for further sending it down the pipeline. Uh, yeah. So maybe before we go on, I mean, I, I, let's have a look at the connections itself. So what is a connection? A connection has a PID, which we will use to tag, again, the container ID. It has a local address. It has a remote address. It has a type, so um, UDP, TCP. It has bytes and packet transmitted and received. It has a direction, so incoming and outgoing, which means if there's a connection between two containers within our fleet, like within our Kubernetes fleet, we will have, actually we will see two connections, right? One incoming, one outgoing. If it's outside our fleet, we will only have like the, the connection part that's in within our cluster, uh, in our cluster fleet. And then there are other, uh, um, uh, there, there are other fields like uh, TCP errors, and so on. I, I left them here. Yeah. Um, so next slide. Yeah. So how does this look like? The bigger picture. Now um, here again, you see on the left hand side what I just showed you. In the cluster, we have the nodes. We have the exporters running. They send connection, DNS queries, and TCP queue um, event data into the vector instances running in our clusters. And those vector instances, they just batch them up compress them and send them further down to a Kubernetes cluster where we have ClickHouse deployed. And in front of this ClickHouse, we have another set of vector instances. They create bigger batches so um, for better in insert performance and just write the raw data into ClickHouse. We, we went with, with vector because it's like, um, as, I, as I showed you the, 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 um, the connections and all the other networks, Events, it's just flat JSON, and it's very, you can ship it very efficient with vector and with a minimal configuration only. So you don't have to do, you, you only care about batching and um, buffering, and that's mostly it, and it's very, it's very efficient. Yeah, like tens of millions, uh, we ship tens of millions of connections and other networks events per second through this pipelines. Yeah, 
Uh, one thing I want to mention here, when we start, when I, when I built the first iteration of this pipeline, it was just like this, and the distribution, like the write requests between the components, it wasn't very good. So what we did, we just slapped Envoy <laughs> in, in front of each of the components here before Vector and uh, in front of ClickHouse, and now the distribution is really nice and HPA works really nice. So when there's more load, uh, the pipeline scales up, and if there's less load, it just scales down. That works really nicely. Yeah, next slide. So um, what's missing? Metadata is missing. We need metadata, right? Because we only have the container ID for our networking events. But for querying, we want all. We, uh, we want we want to to match the container ID with the metadata, so we can um, filter, group, and group by those um, attributes. So what we do is, in clusters, in all our clusters, we watch um, pods. We watch pods using the Cube API. We have the so-called metadata exporter. And every time there's a new pod, we get this information. You will see on the next, next slide um, what it includes, like name, deployment, so on, region, and so on. Um, we batch it. We send it down to another vector instance in, in front of ClickHouse. It works mostly the same way like the other pipeline, just much less volume. And we write it into ClickHouse, also into a separate table. And the metadata looks like this. So um, here we have, I mean, the timestamp is when it happens. Um, so, so we can set a TTL on it. And uh, we, we also like relist every 30 minutes. Um, then there's network, project, region, and so on. So all these attributes um, you can later use to query and filter, and filter um, our uh, network events by. So now, how does this work in ClickHouse itself, right? We have now, in ClickHouse, we have the raw data, we have the metadata, but somehow we want to make this, um, we want to be able to query this in a performant way. And if you just join this, like, let's say, if you, if you join the raw data and aggregate the raw data, um, uh, when you're querying, that, that doesn't perform really well. It works for the TCP queue metrics, but for everything else, the volume is just too high. So what we did, we have a pipeline within ClickHouse. In ClickHouse, there's a concept of materialized view, and a materialized view is a query that's triggered on an insert into a table that it targets, and then it writes the result into another table. And you can use this, in our example, we use this to join the metadata, but also to aggregate um, the connections within a time window. And actually, that's not done by the materialized few. For the people who know um, ClickHouse, that's done by an aggregating merge tree table. So um, how this looks like is a connection comes in. And um, now on each node, so our ClickHouse setup is uh, obviously sharded, so we can keep all the load. And we have two, we have replication factor two for each shard. And the raw tables are all distributed over, um, the raw data tables are distributed over all the nodes, with exception of the metadata, but because the metadata, we want to join on each insert, so the metadata, we replicate over all nodes. So we have all metadata on all nodes, and since this is only like a million entries, that's not a lot for ClickHouse, we can keep it and, um, and, and replicate it over all nodes. And let's say a connection, a batch of connections comes in, what happens, we join the metadata according to the container ID for local and IP for remote. And then uh, we aggregate, or the aggregating merge tree aggregates in within a one a minute window, and then it goes into this aggregated data table. The same happens for um, DNS queries. Obviously, there's no remote, so um, there's only the container ID. Um, did I forget? Yeah, and the TCP query, uh, the TCP queue metrics, they're really low volume, so we can, we, we currently don't do the um, materialized view there. We just um, merge the metadata while we query them. And now, talking about querying, if I haven't forgot something, no, I think I'm fine. Matt will take over and will show you the UI and give you a demo. The part of what we wanted to accomplish with the UI is make it simple to find out what's going on, right? I mean, as I said before, the most common use case for using this, this tool is during problem. So you want to make sure that whatever you're doing 
matches the way we think about the network at Shopify, but also makes it easy to you know, accomplish your goal. A little bit of, of, you know, kind of about our tool Observe, right? So basically all of this lives as a custom plugin um, into Grafana. We have a separate like API that we have built that sits on top of ClickHouse. It does query optimization and a bunch of other different additional facilities, allows us to query different data sets, different tables, um, and it builds a nice little abstraction layer so that the developers don't have to worry about writing a bunch of SQL queries, um, and they can query a common language. It works really well in this case, and, and for this particular use case, it's great. Um, first thing we want to have is a network flow view, right? We want to be able to see what's actually happening with TCP or UDP traffic, when incoming or outgoing, depending on what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, we can uh, data table down at the bottom, basically group by different attributes, different metadata, as Sebastian was talking about, right? So some of the metadata that we have is actually Shopify specific, right? So if I want to say my cluster role, right? That's not a that's not a Kubernetes thing. That's very much a Shopify thing. But we can enhance that metadata and enrich it with additional fields so that we can give our our you know internal customers something a little bit better to work with that meets their own criteria. For the DNS view, a little bit simpler. Um, we're really just trying to understand where failures are happening and how, what those failures look like. Um, still same type of filtering, very common. This particular UI is, is very based on the same component tree that we use for our log and trace analytics. Um, so it was something that we could actually support long term without having have, have a bunch of custom, custom code in there. Um, and something that is leverages a bunch of common component trees. It's been excellent. OK, so now I'm going to, unfortunately, I don't have a live demo for you. I didn't sacrifice to the demo we guys today. <laughs> so I want to. Um, Does it work? But that's correctly. I'll walk you through. Here we go. OK, so what you see here is our NPM investigation tool. Um, first, you want to start by narrowing down your local or remote down to something that you're trying to, to see the flow between. Here I'm going to narrow down our <clears throat> our local uh, cluster to our Prometheus clusters, which is our internal metric system. And I just want to make sure that I'm matching something that is, actually has a remote cluster. So here we're talking about container to container connection and cluster. I'm going to group by a couple different attributes, uh, namespace, we can group by cluster, or region, right, whatever we want there. Um, so I'm just going through and selecting whatever attributes I want to I want to see so I can see how the traffic flows between these two different endpoints um, here I think we're doing the deployment so basically the deployment name right whether we kind of just abstracted the concept there it's not all just only deployments any stateful site or anything like that will also um, grouping by the remotes I'm just going to fo focus on TCP traffic here I don't particularly care about the round trip time right now I just want to see packet flow um, can I help, go ahead and run that so one of the things you'll notice is when we talked about the volume of data that we were dealing with, we're dealing with a ton of network connections. The filtering is extremely quick, right? This gives us back real-time results quickly. Um, I can sort that table by any value that I care about. Uh, here I'm looking at local remote volume. If you have any uh, understanding of Thanos, some of these things may actually sound familiar to you. That's a different topic, though. And here in the table, you can kind of see that to the right, I can keep scrolling, and I have additional metrics that I can look at. And this just tells us, hey, here's where we're potentially seeing issues. Here's where we're seeing you know, problems. If I've got you know, a bunch of TCP retries, then probably something's wrong there. Or if I'm seeing a ton of uh, connections established but not closed, right? then we potentially have something with connection leaks happening there. Um, it's just a kind of a real quick insight. Now, I'm not a network engineer. Sebastian's not a network engineer. Uh, you know, we're observability people, but you know, our goal is to try to help those network engineers figure out what's going on here. Um, and a lot of what we drove off of this is just taking their, you know, kind of concerns here, listening to them, and then making sure we were able to implement. Um, the cool thing about network traffic, right, is I can open a connection here to something over here, and data flows in both directions, right? So I sometimes I need to actually see what's going on there and where we're pushing and receiving data from. So being able to switch. And quickly from outgoing to incoming traffic and see how that data is flowing is key to understanding the health of the network. Um, and kind of can see that there. Obviously, some of these values are decently sized. Um, 
yeah, there's a lot of, this is, keep in mind this is all within our own internal metrics clusters right now, so that's a lot of data we're put shipping around. But you kind of get the, uh, I will get to questions in just a second, yeah. Um, we'll get to, you can kind of see here how we're able to, to quickly get some insights into what's going on inside of our own system. I will say that when Sebastian and I first built this, we started seeing the data here. We started seeing problems in our own clusters, and we were like, oh, we should probably fix that. So um, it's been impactful even just for, for us as a. Uh, real quick. Okay. Obviously, I don't think we have a ton of UDP traffic in our clusters. You'll see some here, but you know, at Shopify, we use a lot of StatsD. So if we're trying to debug something in a client cluster, right? Like that StatsD, we have to see how that UDP traffic's flowing. This is key for us as the observability team and troubleshooting our own system for it. Um, let me just pop ahead. So moving to DNS queries, um, you can see here, I mean, ideally what we're trying to understand here is when things are failing, right? That's where our network team is most likely engaged is when there's a problem. So being able to see where the failure codes are, being able to see, you know, where that's happening. And, you know, we do a lot of, if you, again, know anything about Thanos, Thanos does a lot of, of taking endpoints and doing DNS, so finding the actual endpoints for a service and being able to solve those. There's some issues there, obviously, inside of our side that we've got to take a look at, but you can kind of get a feel for, for how this tool can be used to successfully troubleshoot. Okay. Back to Joaquin. Yeah, so let's talk about limitations because um, I mentioned this already. Currently, we only everything is running in our Kubernetes fleet, and we have more. We have virtual machines, we have Google Cloud Run, so all this stuff we are not watching it. And also, every service that's um, outside of Shopify, um, an external service that we reach out via HTTP or a managed service like a database. We don't, the only thing we know about this is the IP and, um, and also, yeah, within the clusters, we don't support the cluster IP like services and um, host network yet. It's just, we don't have implemented it yet. It's, it's just more effort, we have to do it. Um, yeah, and, and we will do this in the future. Um, as I said, filtering and grouping currently is limited to information within the Shopify Kubernetes clusters or IPs. And um, everything outside, we, we, we don't have information yet. 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 We are working on this. But obviously, it, it needs, it, we need to extend how this whole metadata type, uh, part will work. So it will be a lot of work, I guess. And here's, yeah, here the, the outlook is like adding those external metadata, adding node and cluster IP support. Um, adding metadata for non-Kubernetes workloads, like, like you, for example, you could, you could get traces from our services and then resolve um, uh, URLs to IPs and get those metadata so you can, you can map external services. Um, also, we are working closely with our um, customers or with our like, internal users to enhance features um, according to the feedback and leverage the underlying platform to surface new insights into network activity. Um, one example here would be um, interzone or interregion traffic because this is usually what drives up your cost for high um, traffic services. So we might try to make this visible and if it's possible for the users to place related work notes or work notes that talk to each other within the same region or even within the same zone that can bring down costs um, by a lot. And yeah, that's, that's it. Like, you have any questions, and you can also leave feedback. So, <laughs> questions. So, in the future for um, alerts, thresholds, break, fix, workflows, tickets, that's one set of questions. My other set of question is, 
Um, considering uh, AI workloads and uh, HPC workloads, which have a large amount of parallel NICs, and are you, do you have any plans for future RDMA slash Rocky support? Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to that is we're thinking about as much of that as we can. I mean, I think the primary next step for us is to expand the metadata and get something like an alerting pipeline in place. We have alerts that fire off of different metrics um, right now, but that's that, you know, they're, they come through a different pipeline, but being able to alert on this particular data is something that we are kind of looking at how we can accomplish. And are you publishing an API? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> our, this API is internal and it's changing so rapidly that I don't think we could actually publish it. Um, but it's, uh, you know, our goal here is to service Shopify primarily right now. And then what the future is beyond that is, is really kind of outside of our hands. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious a little bit about your prober. Are you all using Datadog's open source stuff under the hood, That's, or do you have custom stuff built in? Yeah. How do you, yeah. I mean, uh, to give some context on this project, we built this within two weeks, so there was no much space for doing custom stuff, and yeah, the, we, we just used the system probe, which works. Like, to get to this point yourself, I think you have to invest really a lot because this thing is super efficient. Awesome, thanks. You shared a number of tools, uh, EVPF tools uh, in your architecture diagram, uh, but then I heard you specifically called out Cilium. Is that what's generating the, the network metrics for you in this case? Uh, Cilium is managing the EVPF, okay. like the actual probe themselves. Okay. So and the, then those EVPF so Programs get and your, called, and your prober is, is reading uh, the, the shared memory. So maybe to make the, like there's this um, open telemetry networking project, the new one. Like the difference to our solution is why we use ClickHouse is we don't do metrics, we, we actually capture the flows itself and ingest okay. them, which you can't do. I mean, you can do it with metrics, but the cardinality will be, will grow so fast that like it, it would be an insane, you, you would to need to scale your whatever metric solution have to an insane size. So that's the difference. I also had a question about outlier detection. At which layer in your stack here uh, would you be able to do outlier detection? I didn't quite hear that. Okay, okay. Out outlier detection? Oh, yeah. So like anomaly detection? Yeah. Uh, wh where would you have to implement that? Because it sounds like you end up with an aggregate. So it seems like somewhere in the pipeline, I would have to introduce the logic. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as Sebastian said, we, with this project, we, we kind of did the 80% in, in two weeks and then a, you know, a little bit okay. more to get it fully. We haven't really thought through anomaly. We do have some anomaly detection systems inside of Shopify. Um, so there, there's, you know, again, we're, we're kind of on year three of this journey in total of, of in-housing a lot of our observability. Um, so we expect to continue to, to build on top of what we built so far. Something that I mean, okay. the, the idea here would be generate metrics, like do what open telemetry networking does, but do it from the ClickHouse, generate metrics from that, and then do anomaly detection on top of that. I think that would be the way. Okay, Sec a secondary set of metrics that it would generate in the uh, in inside of the ClickHouse processing. No, no, yeah. Okay, and then maybe uh, uh, some post-processing on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, was there any discussion or consideration on the on the enrichment and storage engine used for this, or was ClickHouse already present and just a great fit? Yeah, I mean, I think that we we are using ClickHouse in other areas, and if you go to, um, our, I think it's on our YouTube channel. We yeah, have, we have some of other talks that were given about our observability systems. Um, so it was a kind of a natural fit to try it there because we had that, that kind of operational capability. It was like a playground project a bit for me to try new stuff. An unrelated question, is Shopify doing any accelerated, um, uh, accelerated network traffic like kernel bypass and is that considered at all in this monitoring platform currently? Uh, sorry, it, it's not coming through super loud, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, like are you guys doing anything like onload acceleration, any kernel bypass in the network stack that would, um, uh, that would require additional steps to capture network flow data? That is something that would have be better served for one of our network engineers that I am not one of. <laughs> All right, thank you. 
Um, I think here's a question. It, yeah, I have a question is, uh, all the exporters that you're using, are those open source or uh, you're homegrown? The export is homegrown, yes, but um, the system pro itself, you can find, uh, you can find it, uh, it's, in, it's open source and there's a proto buff, so it's pretty easy to write this exporter. So what the exporter does is mostly scraping and forwarding and using container D to get the um, process ID to container ID mapping. And no, we don't plan to open source it <laughs> oh, for now. Thank <laughs> Sorry. You. Thank you. Actually, to answer the gentleman's question is, when you are using kernel bypass or onload, uh, eBPF actually picks it up. Again, sorry. I didn't get the question. What was it? Uh, no, it's not a question. It was the answering to him. Oh, yeah. That uh, okay. if you're using kernel bypass, using onload or similar product, uh, eBPF will pick it up. Even if okay. it's user space, eBPF all will pick up all the okay. transactions. Thank you. I'm sorry, like for, for the EPPF, I worked with our network engineers. <laughs> they helped me to get this all working. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so when you say system probe, is it, uh, so Datadog agents component is also called system probe. Is there an overlap here? Or are you calling your component also system probe? Is, is, the, is the question if it's the system probe from Datadog agent? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is the system probe from Datadog agent. So you can just run them separately. Got and it. it's very lightweight process that will you can configure which information to get. Cool. Um, so the flow related data that you're collecting is from System Pro, but not from Cilium. Like you could export them from Cilium's Hubble as well, because especially when you're talking about uh, cluster IP resolution, and if you add service mesh on top of it, uh, who resolves the cluster IP to the endpoint IP depends on whether you're using Cilium's cluster IP resolution or service mesh's resolution. And Hubble kind of solves for that. So do you plan on re-implementing some of it, or do you use Hubble? For yeah, what I, yeah, I mean, to, to Sebastian's point, the, the getting up and running was the biggest thing, right? Because this was a gap in functionality. So using what we could off the shelf. We have looked at Cilium, Hubble, custom probes, things like that. That is something that we, we not, not us, but our Shopify as a whole has looked at. Um, the idea is primarily that, that that interface and how we extract the data is less important than getting the data out right now. But eventually, we'll probably have something more custom there. This cool. was just the leg up using an open source component to get a step in the right direction so that then we can figure out what we actually want long term. Got it. Because, um, yeah, we will ex be expanding on the system for sure. Cool. And what is the UI that you're using? It looks great. It's Grafana with custom plugins. Yeah, everything we showed you was actually custom code that runs inside of a, a it's, the Grafana is kind of like, it's a good custom Grafana pl plugin. Um, nothing you saw was actually Grafana except for the outside. <laughs> the um, frame. Of the, everything else is, is we wrote internally. Interesting, yeah, thank you. Hey, um, I'm just wondering if you capture any layer seven data in the flows. What kind of data? Uh, layer seven, just kind of like like details of HTTP requests. It's content. captured, but we don't forward it yet. I think the system probe can do it, but we are not forwarding it yet. Okay, cool, thanks. Any more questions? We have two more minutes. Yeah. Oh, you can, I can repeat the question. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask: Is there a reason that you guys went with a custom uh, plugin on top of Grafana for the visualization, as opposed to like building dashboards with uh, template variables? Yeah, I mean, I think that when we started the pro this process, right, Grafana offered a lot of what we, you know, kind of our primary metric stack is based in the Prometheus world, right? And Grafana plays really well with that. Um, so that offered us again that kind of like leg up in the journey. That wasn't something we had to build or find a different solution for. Um, that is that getting the custom plugin there for these types of things, um, you know, it allows us to integrate a lot of some of the charts you can see come our, our you know, default Grafana charts, but they that we've kind of wrapped with our own custom component tree. Um, but it's again like we're spending time on the things that are most effective for Shopify, and we don't need to reinvent the wheels. Kind of where we started from. I think that's it then. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.